Hello everyone. Firstly, thank you for coming out this evening. I'm the Mayor of Wollanui Council, Judy Hannon, and welcome to tonight's extraordinary community forum and meeting. Just a couple of housekeeping. Your image will be captured as part of this recording. If you object to being filmed, please inform a council officer. I would pay my respects and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which this meeting takes place and also pay respect to elders both past and present. I am the chairperson tonight and would like to introduce you to your councillors and I might add that every councillor is here this evening. I've got the Deputy Mayor Councillor Robert Kahn, I've got Councillor Michael Benassi, Councillor Blair Briggs, Councillor Matt Smith, Councillor Noel Lowry, Councillor Matt Deeds, Councillor Matt Gould, and Councillor Simon Lando. Also present is the General Manager Luke Johnson, Executive Director Ali Dench, Director of Planning Chris Stewart, and Director of Infrastructure and Environment Michael Malone. I'd like to ask first, do any councillors or staff have a conflict of interest to declare? In line with our community forum guidelines, we don't permit the forum to be recorded or the use of electronic media without permission. This includes devices such as laptops, mobile phones, I'm looking for him, somebody, he knows who he is, tape recorders and video cameras. Please place your mobile phones on silent. There are two parts to the forum. The first part is presentations. The presentation tonight is on the review of Council's position on the Wilton Newtown. The second part is the community question statement time, and we will consider these items discussed in this part of the, at the extraordinary meeting tonight, straight afterwards. Councillors have been given a copy of all the questions submitted to consider, even if they aren't addressed tonight. If time allows, we will have some other questions from the floor. Mind you, we've got quite a few questions to get through, so we need to limit them to five minutes each. So we're going to have a presentation first. The presentation tonight on the review of Council's position on the Wilton Newtown. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just as we commence the presentations, one of the critically important issues in relation to um, the Wilton Newtown and the rezoning relates to koalas. So I'm just going to show a brief video on the screen there in relation to koalas. So I'll just ask Tracy to hit the button there. G'day, I'm Damien Sterling from Wollandilly Shire Council. I'm the Environmental Education Officer and we're out here in the bush today as part of the Wollandilly Koala Conservation Project. Now with this project, in 2013 and 14, we were getting a lot of reports from the community telling us about koalas occurring around the Appen area. So we set up the Wollandilly Koala Hotline and in the first 12 months we had over 60 koalas reported. As a result, we were able to secure a Saving Our Species grant in partnership with the Office of Environment and Heritage. Now we're in a koala habitat corridor that runs from Appen down to Wilton and through down to Avon Dam. And we've got big forest red gums and stringy barks, which are all uh, primary food trees for koalas. Now the thing about those trees is that they occur on clay soils. So it's a very small corridor that we're working to try and ascertain where the koalas are moving and how they're moving through that corridor. And then from that we can start to make some informed decisions about how we can conserve that corridor into the future. Now we've been working closely with the OEH and the Koala Health Hub and 15 koalas have been collared for tracking. So each time we catch a koala, we put a GPS unit and a VHF transmitter onto the collar around its neck. So the GPS unit on the koala's collar sends its location twice a day over the internet. And then this website allows us to view the koala's position basically in real time. So we can see here the last 10 days of movements of one one the koala. Um, and from the VHF transmitter, that lets us track the koala in the field um, to go and collect information on the tree species, where it's moved, how big the trees are and that sort of thing. Now, a lot of the uh, koala habitat uh, areas of the corridor actually occur on private lands. So currently as part of the project, we've been out to 60 different private properties and everybody who owns those properties has been really excited about the project as well. If you see a koala hanging in a tree, give us a call on the Wallandilly hotline so that we can come out, confirm the sighting and add that information into our database. 
also another way that people can get involved is with Conservation Volunteers Australia and you can come out and help volunteer within the koala corridors. You can come and help restore their habitat and if you're just lucky you might get a chance to go out and go tracking and actually see a koala in its natural habitat. One of the big issues that we have here uh, is that koalas have been struck by cars on Appen Road, Picton Road and also the Hume Highway. With the information that we've gathered about road strike of koalas, we've been negotiating with the RMS to try and get some protective wildlife fencing on Picton Road, particularly around Allens Creek and Cascade Creek. Wallandilly Wires, if you see an, an injured uh, koala on the side of the road, give them a call. Also Sydney Wildlife and also the South Coast uh, Wildlife Rescue. The important thing about these koalas is that they are the only disease-free population in the state and they're only a small population, there's only 350 of them. So we all need to work together to try and save these koalas and make sure that the habitat is protected for generations to come. Okay, obviously an extremely precious and, um, and valuable resource to have, you know, the only disease-free colony of koalas in the state. Um, Damien, one of our staff members, Damien Sterling, who we just saw on the video, is just going to talk a little bit more about it just for a few minutes. Uh, then we'll have a presentation from Stephen in relation to some strategic planning aspects, and then it'll be over to the questions. But um, Damien. Great, thank you. Um, I thought I'd introduce you to some of the local koalas we have here. Now, Zondo, she's a young free female, three years old, and she's actually been living down in the southeast corner of the rezoned area. She's had a GPS collar on her for the last uh, six months, so since November. Um, one one there beside her, um, he's been hanging around just south of the Wilton rezoned area there. He, uh, he's a 10 year old koala, and so maybe next year we may see some young babies coming along. But Kyburn there is particularly of interest because he travelled all the way over from Athen over the last six months. He's travelled all the way over to Wilton. He came across the Broughton Gorge and unfortunately uh, late last year we lost him to a road strike on Picton Road. Really highlighting the issues that we're having in that area. Now, Allens Creek has been known to be a koala corridor for a long time. Uh, Professor Robert Close did a peer review of some reports and associated with uh, the Wilton Parklands development and he identified that um, Allens Creek was a primary corridor. At that stage it was mainly males that were dispersing. So when a male becomes two, three years old, they need to move away and that's what Allens Creek was all about. But what they identified is there were 20 sightings within a five kilometre radius of the Allens Creek corridor between 91 and 2004. Now, as part of those records, it was noted that there was a mob of koalas down at St Mary's site down here, which was a sign that we had breeding koalas back then. Now, you would have seen that photo uh, in the film that we just saw. That pink area is habitat koala, uh, sorry, koala <laughs> habitat corridors that were mapped in 2007 by the Office of Environment and Heritage. And it was identified back then that, that all that pink area there was primary koala habitat. You can see the areas where we've um, proposed putting some fencing in uh, because of the road strike hotspots as well. And RMS have been very amenable to that. Now, the project's been running for two years. Like I said, we've got Zondo and one one. Now, down at St Mary's late last year, there were two females with backyard. So that's a critical aspect to it being defined as core koala habitat. Um, but also, in the last five years, we've had eight roadkill on the Allens Creek corridor itself on Picton Road. So again, a sign that koalas are using that corridor to travel between the Nepean River and down to the Nepean Conservation Area. Now, all, that's uh, all the sightings from Bionet. As you can see, there's koalas everywhere. A lot of that really densely sort of labelled area is actually the tracking data. So the koalas have been moving from Appen and down to Wilton and sort of back and forth. But you can see if you track Allens Creek up to the Nepean River, there's been koalas sighted through, throughout that area for the last 20 years. Now, the big thing for us is that SEP 44, which is the State Environmental Planning Policy for Koala Habitat Protection, the criteria on core habitat is that we have a resident population of koalas and that's evidenced by breeding females um, and also recent sightings as well as historical records. We have that information here. 
at this point in time, if this was going through council, there would be a comprehensive koala plan of management there to be put in place before any rezonings were approved. And as far as we're aware, this hasn't occurred yet. Now, this is a critical population. This is part of Sydney's last population of koalas. They go from here up to Campbelltown. All the koalas north of Picton Road are the only disease-free koalas in the state. And we need to see protection of these koalas into the future. We want to see the South Western Sydney koala conservation strategy put in place before any further progress happens. $200,000 worth of research has gone into this. And if this is going to be ignored, ignored then we need to question why. But anyway, that's me. Thanks very much, Damo. Um, Sorry, just one quick one. Uh, that circle is basically uh, to the south of Picton Road. That's where Zondo has been residing for the last six months, just to put the context for you. Thank you. Now, in terms of the significance of this issue and the reason we started with a presentation on this, is not only is it a critical issue, but in speaking about it, we're speaking about a part of our community that can't speak for itself. And I think that's particularly important. Uh, so now Stephen Gardner, our strategic planner, is going to give a short presentation in relation to some planning aspects of the river and the as well. Alright, uh, Madam Mayor, Councillors, Community, um, it's great to see a big turnout. Uh, I'm going to keep this fairly short. Um, so basically, I just want to give a quick overview of where we are now and why we're here tonight. Uh, Wilton Newtown, um, as you may know, uh, since about 2011, there was a priority housing sites program announced by the then Minister. Uh, Wilton, among a number of other um, sites, was put up. Uh, since that time, 2012, 13, 14, uh, councils continually um, advocated that um, it's generally supportive of it, providing that uh, it's supported by the right infrastructure and the right clean um, that is are addressed. So it's been a consistent message um, up until recently. Uh, I believe the information's all on our website, so the, the, uh, the message has been very clear the whole way along. Uh, Wilton, a great town, or no town at all. Uh, so in terms of the main view, uh, ironically, Friday the 13th, uh, land was rezoned by the government. Uh, the rezoning, 36,000 houses. Uh, previously, I believe it started off at about 2,500. It then went to 3,000 during exhibition. It came out at 3,600. That's houses, it's not including the population, as, as you may have heard the mayor previously say. Um, there's a new urban development zone that wasn't exhibited as part of the exhibition last year, so it's news to everyone. Um, it's a very, very flexible zone, so I'm not sure if we've had an opportunity to look at it yet, but it's, uh, it's very open-ended. Uh, it's got a few prohibited land uses in there, but it's very flexible. Uh, there's 5,000 square metres of retail, which is a fairly sizable, um, you know, Coles supermarket, etc. It's probably getting up there towards the Ikea's of the world. Not quite, but getting close. Housing density, so I believe this may be somewhat consistent with what they did say previously. So 15 to 25 he um, houses per hectare. Um, what that means is single dwellings, dual occupancies, you see a, a slightly lower density. Then you start getting up to 25 to 45 houses per hectare, which is a much higher density. Again, generally the densities um, could be looked at favourably if they're supported by the right infrastructure, the right services, etc. Um, etc. Et the building heights map shown is it's generally 9 metres across the board. There are pockets of 12 metres in and around uh, two of the main areas, uh, towards the main roads. I'll just see, I think we've got a map uh, coming up, which uh, shows the, the blanket <coughs> of the zone. Uh, if you go back to Damien's presentation where he had the circle, we'll, we'll see it again shortly. But uh, around the red uh, U-shape down the bottom there is, is a really important corridor. Uh, the two, I think I've got just the context, if you're not a planner and, and you want to know where you are, uh, Bingara Gorge, sorry, Bingara Gorge and Wilton, where you buy. So it's a substantial, it's one precinct out of quite a, uh, quite a lot of the precincts in the broader Wilton Newtown area. Again, 36,000 houses, 
the, the government hasn't provided a draft SIP for us yet, so we don't know what infrastructure has been committed at this stage, um, which leads on to these issues. But public transport, no commitment to the public transport's being made yet. The government tells us that there may be interim bus solutions, etc. We don't know where buses might go. We don't know if they're going to actually occur. We've been told that they're probably going to happen. Again, we've been advocating for electrified rail, a whole range of other um, public transport solutions, but there's nothing in writing for us yet. There's a, a voluntary planning agreement that was uh, signed with workers, but the, uh, the, the special infrastructure contribution, the SIC, hasn't been uh, drafted yet. Uh, on the information on the website, it talks about that time frame being uh, mid to later this year with the final one released this year. Planning 101, you would think that you have the plans and the infrastructure looked at up front and delivered as part of a package so we know what to expect. Uh, jobs, talking about a one-to-one -one ratio. Unfortunately, where's the detail? How are we going to get those jobs on the ground? What are the real jobs that we're going to secure? Part of that might have been through an integrated healthcare precinct or hospital. Again, they're talking about possibly providing this as part of the precinct, but we haven't seen the detail of where that will be. Um, again, with the urban development zone, because it's so flexible, it also takes away the, the um, pinpoint accuracy of providing where these types of activities will occur. So um, the flexibility of the zone is actually letting these sorts of commitments down, which might have actually got government's um, announcement. While of protection, um, Damien did a fantastic talk. Obviously, I'll, I'll bring up a map again in a second, just to reinforce what Damien showed. Uh, and finalisation, I, I think I've just mentioned that, but it, again, it's, we haven't seen a draft there. We, we have been part of discussions earlier on, but we haven't seen a draft and we don't know what's in it. So therefore, some of the work that council would need to do with the local infrastructure, we haven't completed because we need to know what the rest of the detail is to work out our own <coughs> And finally, uh, there's the area overlay. Um, it's similar to where Daniel showed before. There's some koala vegetation mapping uh, from the state government. So you can see, you'll start to see it as I bring over the next slides. There's the koala sightings. The yellow are the sighting and they're alive. The white ones are the unfortunate great koalas. Uh, Keep an eye on where the pocket is with the urban development zone. So again, there's the habitat corridor, urban development zone goes quite well through, right through the middle of the pile of habitat. Nice big row through there as well, and uh, that's overlaying it all together. So um, a bit concerning. Uh, it's not to say, as I, as I said at the start, council up until this point have been generally supportive of rules and providing it's done in the right way with the right things. I think from a council officer's point of view, uh, turning 101, we want to ensure that all the planning is done right up front with the, the right amount of infrastructure, right commitments made, um, a land use implementation plan for the board of precinct hasn't been released yet either, which would have showed how all of this connected. Um, I, I guess that's where we're up to today. Thank you, Stephen. So, just confirming 3,600 houses um, in this rezoning. Council has been very clear and consistent in its advocacy in relation to Wilton, a great new town or no town at all. And our concerns, we have a number of concerns and they all arise from the fact, really, that we believe that this rezoning is premature. So now I'll hand back to the mayor. Thank you. So part two is community question or statement time. This is uh, all relating to item GR1, review of council's position on Wilton Newtown in the extraordinary meeting agenda. We will limit speakers to five minutes and similar questions will be grouped together. I must reinforce that community forums are held to provide information and allow comment. They are not a debate night. Kindly address me as a chair or your councillors on all occasions and please stick on to the, the subject matter and don't make personal remarks about individuals. General Manager Luke Johnson will read out the executive summary from the council report for the agenda item discussed tonight. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so the executive summary reads as follows. The purpose of this report is to appraise the recent rezoning of the Wilton South East Precinct. Under legislation, a person who makes a relevant planning application or public submission 
is required to disclose any reportable political donations. The disclosure requirements extend to any person with a financial interest in the application or any associate of the person making a public submission. No disclosure of political donation has been made in association with this application. I'll now to read an abbreviated version of the recommendation that's in the report, because the recommendation in the report is quite long. Um, it reads as follows. The Council write to the New South Wales Premier and Minister for Planning, informing them that Council intends to reconsider its in principle support for Wilton Newtown, pending certain matters being addressed, including a business case for delivery of electrified rail, establishment of an integrated healthcare precinct, demonstrated compliance with job creation targets, preparation and finalisation of the South Western Sydney Koala Conservation Strategy, and receipt of a response from the February, February 2018 notice of motion from the, from the Department of Planning and Environment. So we're still awaiting a written response to that. Uh, the report also recommends a further report be referred to an ordinary council meeting in June outlining any response from the New South Wales Government to the above matters so that council can reconsider its in principle support for Wilton Newtown. That council writes to the Minister for Planning requesting the urgent repeal of the rezoning of that portion of Wilton South East Precinct that forms part of the Allens Creek Primary Koala Habitat Corridor. That council writes to the Federal Minister for the Environment and Energy requesting that Sydney's last koala population be protected under the Federal Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act 1999. And finally, that Council seeks involvement from interested community representatives to assist Council in the further promotion of Council's A Great New Town or No Town at All campaign. Thank you. I might add that if you can just wait till the Council meeting straight after this, I suspect that whilst that's the recommendation, Council laws will probably put an alternate that's probably stronger than that. So we'll see how we go. Can I have speakers? First speaker up tonight is Christine Nelson. Christine here. If you'd like to come up to the microphone. Madam Chair, councillors, thank you for receiving the question. There are a lot of things that I would have liked to have commented on, but I decided to just go with one specific aspect, uh, if this new town is going ahead. Um, and the one I've focused on is transport infrastructure. And I won't go into rail because there are experts that will do a much better job than me on that. But I would like to talk about funding for transport infrastructure and in particular the road network. Uh, last, during last year, I made an appointment with Mr Gyrell to discuss a thought I had. I've had the benefit of working overseas for numerous years where people are much more open in their thinking to alternative ways of approaching something. And one of the frustrations I've had since coming back to Australia is the bureaucracy and the can't do it that way attitude rather than the can-do. So my suggestion to Mr Rao, because I've given a lot of thought to funding, read through VPAs and understand how VPAs work. So eventually developers provide all this funding for all sorts of infrastructure, but particularly to council for roads. So my question to Mr Rao was, why can't the state government loan the money for the infrastructure to council, for council roads, prior to development starting. And this money could be repaid as the VPA points are triggered. So that ultimately no one is, is out of pocket. People are happy. You have the right infrastructure to start with, and, it, and particularly the community would be most happy about that. So my question is to council, has Council considered approaching state government for an interest-free loan for the development of road infrastructure prior to any development? Such a loan would be able to be repaid as developer meet the requirements of the PO triggered events. Very short. It's a good idea. Um, I'm sure that's not how things are normally done, but certainly it's something that we should consider. 
Thank you. Thank you. Because Mr. Rowell's comment was it was not possible, it had to go back to council. Anything's possible. Exactly. Thank you. Can I have Sue Gay, please? Affordability 
as a crucial issue and seeks to address it by making housing, housing more affordable in terms of increasing supply and diversity of type products. Sydney immediately requires 100,000 dwellings now and a further 725 new homes to accommodate the 2.1 people, million people by 2036. That is 825,000 homes to Sydney. There are several factors limiting supply, mostly councils. Just hurry it up, that's all. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Can I have Fiona Bullock, please? This does not mean rush through and take shortcuts. This does not mean ignore the rules. We expect more from the developer, more of council, more from the department planning, and more from the New South Wales government. We will be the ones that are left living with the increasing costs associated with your poor planning. We will be the ones stuck in the traffic jams that you have caused by your inadequate traffic modelling and by the absence of electrified rail. We will be the ones coping with the odour and the environmental impacts of your multiple sewage treatment plants. This is the legacy that you will leave us if you continue down this path. We want you to stop. Take the time to do a proper business case. Work together with the other developers, with government and with the community to get a combined master plan that is workable, one that is integrated and worthy of the greenfield site that you have in your possession. Respect the privilege you have. Think about the future of the environment, of sustainability and of our children that will grow up with the legacy that you are about to put here. We expect more. You need to deliver or cut your losses and get out. Thank you. Lucinda Hugh Hewitt, please. A hard act to follow. speaking, but certain cases need to be talked about. I grew up in a very tiny little country town called Watson Park, just up the road from Oran Park. We all know what happened there. It's a sea of houses and traffic chaos. This is what is headed this way. I just read an article this morning that said over 50,000 homes are coming to this area. This meeting is for Wilton South East, but it, is, it should be treated as a whole. The big picture must be looked at. The vital ingredient is transport. It is well known fact that towns without rail, that towns with rail thrive, without, stagnate and die. For Wilton South East, the Walker Corporation, we have just said that it was 6, 000, uh, 3,600. That's very conservative. All the reports that we've read are 5,000 homes. And we actually think that is very conservative as well. For the rail, the Malden Dumbarton rail is not on the current maps. Why has it been left off? Is it not coming? For the roads, from the voluntary planning agreement, 10 million has been allocated from the walkers for the road connections to Picton Road. Previous reports for Picton Road from the Appen proposal for the airport proposal was 46 million to bring Picton Road up to standard. 46 million. Who is going to pay for that? With 5,000 homes, that's our estimate, our low estimate, for Wilton South East, no trains, 
That's at least 10,000 cars added to the already overloaded roads. Picton Road must be upgraded to at least the six lane road. As I said, who will pay for this? 46 mi 460 million. That's a hell of a lot of money. For trains, here's a, something to think about. How does a school leader get to Wollongong Uni? This is our local <coughs> uni for technology, the way of the future. For this area to breed intelligent, productive minds, education is just a basic necessity. Currently, it would take seven hours to walk there, two and a half hours to ride their bike, 10 minutes by bus to Picton, 30 minutes train to Camp Town, and an hour and 15 minutes bus to Wollongong. That's a total of an hour and 55 minutes to get to uni. Depending if the transfer is mine, uh, it can be up to four and a half hours, Ask Google, I did. Or their alternative is to drive for 35 minutes, and that is more young drivers mixed in with the already heavy traffic trucks and that have no trains. So you're putting young children into cars, getting to uni against the truck and dogs that are out there. Now, accidents waiting to happen, more road kills, not just the koalas. Trains would save lives. Now, this is meant to be the Wilton South East, but it needs to be seen as a big picture. There is also Wilton North. That's the Bradcorp development. There is 5,500 homes. The rail lines border the top of that site. Why no train station? With a very small parking station at Picton and a non-existent parking station at Douglas Park, surely this is a no-brainer. We need a train station. With no rail, 5,500 homes over 11,000 cars need to be need to access from Wilton North. Wilton North will be landlocked by the developers. Access to Picton Road is at least 10 years away. The only access via the, the Cattle Bridge area. On and off access will be provided, from, provided to and from the north. But why not the south? This would solve all the issues regarding the residents in Bangara. The major safety issue also for the emergency services. So at least from both sites, over 21,000 cars and no money from either developers to improve the main roads, let alone any of the local roads. We have two bridges in the area that are one car at a time. That's Broughton Pass, being Wilton to Abbott, and Douglas Park Drive Weir. The cliff edge in Douglas Park Drive, it's crumbling now, and you're going to add 21,000 cars to the roads just from these two developments alone, and there's a bigger picture. It's not just Wilton South East and it's not just Wilton North. There's more coming. So my question is, do you have an updated traffic studies and impact on the regional roads since the traffic lights have been put in on Picton Road? No, didn't think so. We have no current study to the impact on transport. We see no commitment to any infrastructure and transport. Please, please don't just throw your hands up in the air and say it's too hard. Don't turn this area into another Hoxton Park and Orange Park. Infrastructure must come first. You have the chance to plan. If this is going to be as big as the talk is, it must be a unified plan. Please look at the big picture and give us a home to be proud of, not a sea of houses. Thank you. Just to give you a little bit of concept, sort of size-wise, at this point in time, Bingara has 600 houses. So that's all that is there at this point in time, and we're talking about 3,600 minimum on that one portion, and yes, it'll probably be higher. Um, can I have Stuart Bullivant, please? Madam Mayor and Councillors, uh, thank you for the opportunity to ask this question. Uh, a bit of background before I ask the question. Uh, I'm part of the Wet Wilton Action Group, and once again, as uh, previous members stated, I'm not anti development, but I'm here to, on the part why I'm involved is that what if development does occur needs to be in a future proof way, that it doesn't become a legacy to us of this lovely greenfield site that we live in, in the community. That, uh, the rural community that we live in. 
we've, there's um, the flyers and the, the posters that are around us uh, this evening with the printer of the hall talk about Wilton South East. However, that's, as was previously mentioned by a couple of the other speakers, that's, they're not the only parts of this. Back in 2012, Wilton Newtown, or Wilton Junction as it was called then, was mooted and proposed to get to the council. We are now seeing today that there's, it's not called Wilton Junction, it's now council's taken the approach of calling it Newtown, but then the developers aren't referring to that at all. They're calling it Wilton South East from one of the developers. We now have Wilton North, which is another developer in it. And from what I can see, the unified Wilton Junction slash Newtown plan doesn't exist anymore. All the, all the studies that were used in, and put forward to the state government for the original development was on the holistic whole area. Now we're looking at being fractured, and my question is this. In the Wilton North site, in the current, uh, just, uh, current uh, Wilton North planning agreement that has been uh, published, talking about development contributions, it says that it's based upon 5,000 five and a half thousand properties. However, if you go to the if you go to, go to the Bradcourt website, in one page it says five and a half thousand homes, and in other so other areas it says it's five thousand four hundred homes. Now if but they also state in the same flyer that there is a uh, three and a half billion dollar investment in the Wilton North precinct. Now with the five and a half thousand dollar blocks that equates to, in order to recover that at cost to Bradcourt, that equates to the cost of a block of land of being $637,000 at cost. And yet the proposal states that this is an affordable housing precinct. <laughs> so the question I put to um, the council is, how is a block of land that will cost more than $6,000 $636,000 to be considered affordable housing. Does this mean that the developer intends to increase the number of residential lots to be developed? This has already happened and is still happening within Gara Gorge. Madam Mayor just stated that there's currently 600 dwellings in Gara Gorge. Recently, that developer has just taken the state government to court and has won to seek permission to increase the amount of lots in that development. There is no, there's no uh, transparency or discussion about how the infrastructure that is there in Bingara Gorge is going to be increased. That is my concern about Wilton South East and also Wilton North developments at this stage. They're talking about this is what it's going to be, but in order to get the best return for buck for the developer, there's no, I don't believe that transparency is there. Thank you. Thank you. Can I have Brian Williams, please? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and thanks to us for the opportunity to speak with you tonight at this special panel for us. Um, I just want to give some background on us, Scott and Action Group. We were formed in February of this year after a few of us started chatting at the Northern North Community Consultation put on by the Department of Planning at Wilton Public School. We were all concerned actually by the lack of detail and lack of any answers to our questions to our previous individual submissions for Wilton South East in September last year. Most of us hadn't met before, but we've been spending hours reading through the pages of technical reports on the Department of Planning website, amongst others. We decided to pull our resources and start an action group to present an alternative to the Department of Planning's apparent desire to let developers bulldoze and build first and ask the hard questions later. Needless to say, there was no response to our latest submission from the Department of Planning on Wilton North in March this year. The submission being filed on the Department website as being from a private individual, me, along with the Environmental Protection Authority submission. Wilton faces development on a scale not seen in New South Wales before. The city plan is the largest new city in New South Wales for over 100 years and beyond the scale of Port Macquarie. The current proposals, as my colleague Stuart and others have just pointed out, are vastly different 
from the high concept Wilton Junction plan was presented just a few years ago in 2012. We now have four developers who are talking to each other, running their own separate shows. There is no cohesive master plan, and rumours already abound that the developers walk and break corporate planning to sell their sites to a Chinese developer. Large-scale development has been on the cards for Wilton ever since the freeway was built in the 1980s. Developers and speculators have been land banking here ever since, and what was once fertile and productive dairy farming land has been laid to waste. And now, the entire MacArthur region is under siege from developers who will be dumping cookie cutter dormitory suburbs on our doorsteps without adequate provision of jobs or public transport. The state government now proposes to cut a swathe even further through the district with the M9 orbital. For what? To funnel the 100,000 new residents of Wilton Action and Appen to jobs that might exist, perhaps at Badgeries Creek? I, with all this analysis, I have to say that WAG, Wilton Action Group, is drowning in reports and submissions. We're planning on setting up some research groups to focus on key areas, but we need help with things like desktop publishing, campaigning, and media. So I'd just like to say now, if you want to help, or just want to be informed, please fill out the contact sheets that are being passed around the room or outside. I want to say this is a greenfield site, as has been said by my colleagues. This is an extraordinary opportunity to do something different to previous developments that respects the fragile environment in which it is located. WAG ensure, aims to ensure this new town is an innovative, sustainable, healthy and harmonious community. We do not support cookie-cutter dormitory suburbs that only serve developers' profits to be dumped here without service, infrastructure, education and employment. WAG also aims to advocate for the environment with creatures who don't have a voice, as the general manager said, like the last colony of disease-free koalas. We believe that a greenfield site the scale of Wilton presents a once-in-a-generation opportunity to create a city for the future and suggests that an international design competition should be held as was done for Canberra in the early 20th century. Now for my question. Given that Council will be pursuing various actions to have the rezoning of South East Wilton repealed and the whole Wilton Newtown development re-examined, Wilton Action Group requests Council also look at the following for action. One. Commissioning a full hydrological analysis to determine the future adequacy of the water supply for Wilton Newtown projected population of 50 to 60,000 people, allowing for impacts like factors like climate change and future mine closures on that critical limited water supply from the local dams. Two, mining. Testing the claim by the developers of Bradcourt that they have a perpetual commercial agreement to halt the long haul mining under Wilton North. What are the implications of this agreement? for cost of houses to be built on Wilton North, in addition to what Stuart Bulletin has just shown. Can Council update the forum on the campaign to have the crack report on future mining and water release? Three, in the light of claims by New South Wales government and media personalities that the Wilton development is all about affordable housing, getting certainty from developers about the real number of types of houses and apartments they will build here, given the current median price of a house in Wilton is now 894000 my colleagues here have already presented these costs in relation to the world. We note that the New South Wales government's formal definition of affordable housing is community and social housing for low-income people and families. And in terms of making Newtown, what's a Newtown affordable by council, pressing for proper, proper rail infrastructure, etc., what initiatives will the council itself take to help jobs be created in Milton Newtown? I'm thinking here of council's demand for the hospital, here as healthcare is and will be the fastest growing sector for jobs, its own economic strategy in 2015 and the jobs for the future strategy of August 2016, which was a partnership between New South Wales government, private business and academics, a model that could be considered for implementation here. If these questions can't be answered satisfactorily to Council, we call on Council to withdraw its in principle support for the new Wilton and Newtown development. Finally, to everyone here, if you don't want Wilton to be another soulless, cookie cutter developer with no real heart, or concern for the beautiful place it could be. A model development that is people, not profit driven, then you need to make your voice known in every way you can. The Wilton Action Group thanks Council for this opportunity to speak with your attendance here tonight at this special community forum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to ask Fiona, did you have something else? Because you only went for half of your speech, I'll let you have the other half now. Sorry. The planning documents um, suggest a wastewater lake at Wilton North Development. But we've heard from the Department of Planning staff and also Sydney Water at the consultation days that a lake is not viable. 
why is this lake now included in the recently released voluntary planning agreement? If it's not viable, why is it there? We don't want a wastewater lake that is a public health risk. This lake will be filled with water that is not fit for swimming. It's essentially the third stage of the wastewater treatment process. Do you want to be sitting around sipping coffee around that? Why have it at all? Who is going to bear the cost of maintaining it? The lake in Harrington Park, which is actually only stormwater, not wastewater, has blue-green algae and health warning signs all around it. It has rubbish floating in it. It has bird droppings coating the paths, inches thick in some places. And the mud absolutely stinks when the water level is low. Why would we want this in our community? The most recent documents for Wilton South East is even more confusing. It seems they don't know if they need a wastewater treatment plan. Not sure where they think the wastewater is going to go. What is going on? Has cooperation between the developers broken down? Are we going to end up with four separate wastewater plants so that no matter which way the wind blows, the smell stench will drift towards us? Where is the partially treated wastewater going to go? Early plans suggested it was going to be irrigated onto the undeveloped land. Is this still the case? Is this environmentally responsible, being on the boundary of the water catchment area? Is there a risk of polluting the local creeks and river systems? On some of my rides over Broughton's Pass while it was shut, I did see a platypus in Broughton's Pass. Now, if they're there, they're probably in Alice Creek too. Might not have seen them, but that does not mean that they might not be there. We do not need to add more pollution into these river systems. <coughs> What happens during periods of rain if you're going to irrigate the undeveloped land? The land's already wet. What do you do with water then? It's obviously going to end up in those creeks and river systems. We just cannot have this poor planning. You can't not plan for where the wastewater is going to go. you all updated, I have four more other submissions that we're going to deal with. Clinton Weaving. Good evening, Mayor, Councillors, General Manager, Distinguished Guests and all the residents. I'm the resident of Wilson, a business owner, the president of the school, a member of this 355 committee, the vice president of the AFL club. And there has been very good points raised tonight, I must admit. The public has been informed of this development for five, over five years, including interactions from the Wilton Junction Community Group. Many locals have been involved in the process this entire time, and it has also been a public exhibition and had six drop-in sessions, of which I attended for the, for the public. Sorry, public has been adequately notified of all this. I myself handed out 350 flyers and spoke to parents at the local school informing them of the educational part who were attending one of the drop-in sessions. I believe by not supporting this development, this will set back the future of Wilton five years and be detrimental to the local community. This is, there is urgent needs for a public high school, which is long overdue. Our public uh, school is nearly, well, it's nearly at capacity. Uh, sporting grounds, soccer, and we don't have, we've got netball, uh, we don't even have netball courts in Wilton. Um, AFL, rugby league, union, hotels, motels, restaurants, industrial areas so business can operate and provide work for our local community. Trains won't come until the population grows, so this needs to be stopped being a priority topic for the commitment, commencement of this development. I recently helped start a Wilton Chamber of Commerce and we couldn't even find a venue uh, in Wilton to hold a meeting as everything was closed on Monday nights and we have had the same problem going forth trying to find venues that are open after 6pm in Wilton that will hold 30 or 40 people. The spa has already gone broke because the population is too low and other businesses are struggling due to the delays of the development. 
you don't even start a business because there is no industri industry area in the Wilton. How is employment an issue to council when you're slowing down a DA process in the east area where there is industrial land available, hurrying this along will provide more employment for local community. As you can see, I'm heavily involved in the Wilton area and the community and a majority of people that I speak to just want this to hurry along. They're sick of the politics and the misleading information and just want this to hurry up and get started. I also find it personally insulting that councillors has recognised Wilton Action Group when the council have not engaged with any other community groups because they're supportive of the development. A squeaky wheel is the negative minority and they are far outweighing by the majority that want this to happen ASAP. The only reason the majority are not noisy is because they're sick of hearing about it and just want the development to start. Thank you.
they are working with um, council. In fact, they are working against council. I, I'm not sticking up for council, but I have reviewed the submissions that council have made, and they've made intelligent and justifiable submissions, and they continue to be ignored. <coughs> Another objective is providing services and social infrastructure to meet changing needs. These are principles of the Greater Sydney Commission plans, to which um, Wilton is a part of that plan, and is therefore under legislation required to be implemented. Talks about housing supply and choice and affordability. Uh, one of Stuart here spoke about affordability. It's a joke. Talks about protecting and enhancing bushland and biodiversity and also reducing carbon emissions and managing energy, water, waste efficiently. And Fiona talked about that as well. So I can say that there are a number of uh, planning principles and, and objectives that are within the legislation that are not adequately being satisfied with this development. The problems with will only continue because it is poor planning. So my question to Council is, has the Council reviewed its legal standing in respect to remedying the poor planning outcomes, including Section 3.11, bracket 2 of the EPNA Act? Can I have Stuart call me, please? <clears throat> Mayor, General Manager, Councillors, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, it's been a very informative night. And you can see there's a lot of, uh, lot of uh, uh, strength of uh, character behind everything that's been said. This is not really an argument against uh, the development either. Um, in fact, it's been a very informative night. I'd love to uh, talk some more about getting the students involved with the koalas. That looks like a terrific project. What we need is a satisfactory outcome. I think everyone's agreed with that tonight. It's been said a few times. And what we need is to avoid further delay. I think that picks up Clinton's point. Um, so in some ways we're arguing together. <coughs> we are a service provider. Our college, Wollongilly Anglican College, is a service provider. We provide choice for people. We, in order to do that, have to, had to establish a business plan going forward. And uh, we had to establish critical paths for that business plan. It requires a financial plan, an HR plan, uh, many hours of work and uh, many dollars spent, but all for a worthwhile course to create a second campus. Uh, we have based that on the fact that we will be surrounded by communication and cooperation and you can make a judgment as to how much that has happened. A good plan allows for delay, of course it does, and ours does too. But uh, the delay, I've got to say, uh, is placing more and more pressure on the project. Hence my call for a satisfactory outcome, but also avoiding further delay. There is a massive established need for not only an independent school in the area, but schools in the area which are provided for in this plan. Uh, just speaking from the independent school point of view, there's a massive need established for a second campus and uh, there's pressure on places. So again, looking for a satisfactory outcome, avoiding further delay, uh, we are already part of Wollandilly. Um, it is our local area and we love it. And we stand ready to assist. Can I have Carolyn Ellis, please? Thank you, Carolyn. Do you want to read that out?
Oh, sorry. Um, I just don't want Wilton to turn out like Hamilton. Um, so uh, I guess my question is, um, what kind of food outlets, establishments are considered for this development? As a local, I am concerned that the area will be populated by fast food chains like MacArthur and Yellow. I want to live in an area where small, independent businesses thrive, not be squashed by you know, these. That's it. Thank you. So I'm going to do th two things. I'm going to read, there is a petition that we have organised and it relates to the koalas and about protecting them. So this petition will be available over there and there are replied uh, paid envelopes that are available as well. Now, we can't have these done on the internet to actually be able to be presented in, in Parliament. They need to actually be filled in. So if people can get them filled in and take some photocopy down and fill them in and distribute them and send them back, that would be really, really useful. And the staff will hand some of them around. I'm also going to, in fairness for the community coming out tonight, I'm actually going to shift the council meeting forward a little bit so that we can continue with the evening and you can see the outcome of the evening. Um, if you can distribute those petitions.